Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're discussing Afghanistan with Dr. Zahir Wahab, Professor Emeritus, Lewis and Clark College, and the American University of Afghanistan. He was born and raised and schooled in a village in Afghanistan, attended the American University of Beirut, Columbia University, and Stanford University. Zahir Wahab was Senior Advisor to the Minister of Higher Education of Afghanistan from 2002 to 2006 taught at Kabul University and Kabul Education University from 2006 to 2013, and directed MA programs and taught full-time at the American University of Afghanistan from 2013 to 2019. Zahir Wahab, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David Swanson. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, Thank you for coming on. Uh, What is the current state of affairs for people living in Afghanistan? The current situation, by all counts, is uh, the worst, perhaps, in the world. Um, You know, hunger, poverty, food insecurity, uh, sickness, COVID, droughts, diseases, oppression, lack of cash, lack of activity, misery, all of these are rampant. You know, the vast majority of the poor, whether you listen to the World Health Organization, UNHCR, the World Food Program, UNESCO, UNAMA, CARE, UNICEF, etc., or my own observation, information, uh, it is the worst humanitarian uh, crisis on earth. Uh, you know, nine out of 10 people actually are food insecure. Uh, people are so poor, so desperate, uh, that they have resorted to selling their body parts, family members, uh, household belongings, whatever they have, you know, to feed themselves. And even that is very, very difficult. Um, politically, you know, um, the situation is rather unstable, although on the surface looks stable. But, you know, the Taliban uh, are in a way in charge, but there is uh, resistance uh, in many parts of the country. Uh, uh, there is a repression, especially uh, in terms of uh, human rights, uh, women's rights, uh, freedom of the press, um, you know, education, uh, etc. The situation is not very good. Women uh, essentially have been sort of excluded from um, public life, uh, although women uh, do go to higher education, uh, but they are, their classes and days are separate. Uh, schools, as you know, by and large, are closed um, uh, at the middle and high school level, although girls do go, uh, let's say girls' schools. Uh, so, uh, the situation is, is very, very bad, desperate. In fact, you know, surveys indicate that um, Afghanistan was the unhappiest country in the world uh, last year and uh, previous years, uh, you know, and uh, anyone who can is leaving. Uh, there have been a massive exodus in the last year or so. Uh, people are trying to leave in any way they can. Um, university professors, lawyers, judges, civil rights activists, uh, you know, journalists, etc. It's a very bad situation. In fact, they think it's one of the worst crises in history and perhaps the worst situation on earth today. It, and the whole world is watching. And, and worse than, I take it, than Yemen or Syria. I I mean, the competitions coincidentally, or maybe I should ask you, is it a coincidence that all the top candidates for worst place in the world are places the U.S. military has recently been fighting? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, When they rank the, for example, the number of refugees, uh, first comes Syria, as you know, and second is Afghanistan. It has the largest number of uh, refugees, uh, anywhere from Portland, Oregon, all the way to Pakistan. Uh, so in, in, in terms of death and destruction, death, uh, pain and suffering, you know, uh, psychological problems, etc., 
It is. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, we know. Uh, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Somalia, as you know, uh, you know, Yemen, um, African countries in this region, as you know, the United States has uh, essentially crippled Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and they're intervening in other countries, true. So when we get to that point, uh, David, uh, uh, what, how we came to this point, uh, we will talk about the role of the uh, U.S. and other um, co yeah. criminals, I would well, say. I, so I, I am we, curious, we, what you what do you think are the causes uh, of how we got here, uh, and including, do you think things are better in any ways or worse in any ways than when the U.S. military uh, was there prior to the U.S. military withdrawal? Well, uh, yes and no. In fact, how we got here, as you probably know, uh, foreigners, i.e. Great Britain, uh, deposed King Amanullah in the early part of the 19th century, the first modernizing king, you know, who brought the country a constitution, opened schools for girls and women, you know, uh, civil society, allowed civil society, and tried to modernize the country, but uh, King Amanullah was deposed by the British through its mullahs in Afghanistan in 1929. And then the United States, of course, when it was organizing a CETO, S-E-A-T-O, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization in the 1950s, it excluded Afghanistan and went with Pakistan. And then, of course, uh, the United States indirectly made life very difficult for the first Republican Mr. Muhammad Dawood, uh, in the 1970s, early 1970s. Uh, and then the, the United States and its allies, namely Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, uh, organized the so-called Mujahideen when the progressives or the leftists uh, were in power in Afghanistan from 1997 uh, to 1998 or so, when the Soviet was in Afghanistan from 1990s. 79 to 1989, and the United States and its allies organized, of course, the Mujahideen, and the Mujahideen then actually, and the leftists, as you know, were essentially then driven out, and so was the Soviet Union. And the Mujahideen, in a way, gave rise to what we know, the Taliban today. And then over the last 20 years, as you know, it wasn't just the United States, which unjustly, unfairly, and illegally, and immorally, I would say, uh, invaded Afghanistan in October 19, uh, October 2001, because as you know, Afghanistan had nothing to, little to do with the 9-11 crime here in the United States. The 19 hijackers were, 17 of them were from Saudi Arabia, and three others were from other other countries. The Afghans had nothing to do with 9-11. In fact, the vast majority were not born in 19, in uh, 20. Uh, or one. So the United States, and at one point, as you know, they were occupying, invading troops from 40 different countries, uh, you know, which occupied and, you know, caused from 19, uh, from 2001, I keep saying, 2001 to uh, August 2021, uh, they caught, killed hundreds of thousands of innocent Afghans, people who were not even born then, caused an enormous amount of you know, death and destruction and, you know, uh, supported essentially very corrupt, inept, alienian and predatory regimes, uh, the so-called uh, two, uh, quote, democratic regimes. Uh, so, uh, and made the country very dependent on foreign aid. As you know, during the occupation over the last 20 years, more than 70% of the Afghan national budget came from foreign assistance. And many came and many left, as you know. Uh, Transparency International uh, has been ranking Afghanistan as the most corrupt country in the world for the last several years. Uh, so the U.S. occupation and allied occupation, you know, made Afghanistan uh, very developed, I mean, dependent on foreign uh, assistance, uh, it didn't do anything, hardly very little, to uh, develop uh, health, education, agriculture, infrastructure, and so forth. So 
It spent money on cosmetics, and of course there was massive corruption, embezzlement, as Cigar has pointed out repeatedly. So I would say the United States and its uh, uh, co-conspirators over the last 20 years uh, produced, and I would say deliberately produced and underdeveloped today's Afghanistan and, uh, you know, a year ago, finally, the Afghan the American-sponsored Afghanistan regime collapsed, dissolved itself, uh, escaped with tons and tons of money, and now we have the Taliban. When I, Zahir, when I read articles about the one-year anniversary of the United States military leaving, the main story seems to be the combination of a falsehood with an omission, the falsehood being that the Afghan government would not turn over Osama bin Laden so a war was needed, uh, would not allow him to be put on trial anywhere for any crimes, uh, and the omission being that none of these reports mention that prior to the ending of the war, there was a war going on, and now there isn't. Uh, so that all, the, all, the, all the failures of the Taliban government are reported on uh, quite well. But, uh, but a- am I right that these are problems with the, the reports we're getting? Well, um, the reports are, you know, um, mostly sort of really filling pages there for public consumption. Uh, you know, when... The the then Taliban in 2001 tried very hard to settle this issue uh, with the United States through diplomacy, through the OIC, through the International Court of Justice, through the UN or a third country. But uh, the United States, Bush and Khalilzad, I should say, refused to negotiate with the Taliban and said, we will not negotiate. Rumsfeld, Bush, Cheney, and all these others, uh, Paul Wolfowitz. So, but also, uh, we now know that uh, not all of the Taliban, in fact, even knew that bin Laden was there. And as we should point out, it was the United States and its proxies, you know, the Mujahideen regime that brought bin Laden from the Sudan to Afghanistan. Uh, you know, to help the United States, the CIA, and and so forth against the... So, again, even then, it was the United States and its allies, especially Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, to blame for that. Just like uh, recently, Ayman al-Zawahiri, you know, it it, it seems clear that uh, not all of the Taliban leadership knew that Zawahiri was in Kabul, uh, living in the guest house that belonged to one of the Taliban leaders. Uh, and so, you know, he was discovered. How he was discovered, one doesn't know. Was it one of the Taliban? Was it the Pakistanis, some other Afghan, or who reported on him? So, and still, you know, as I said, the Taliban then tried to resolve this issue through other means, but the United States would not have it. So today, too, uh, you know, the United States, the only solution, like the, you know, the stealing of the Afghan uh, uh, money uh, and uh, engaging the uh, economic uh, in the economic warfare, the sanctions and so forth. I mean, the United States, uh, as we know, whether it's in Afghanistan or in Syria, Iraq, or Venezuela or Ukraine, is very quick to embark on a war rather than dealing with uh, these serious issues through diplomacy, negotiations, and other means. Uh, so I have to say I'm sorry that the United States and the allies are directly, not just implicated, but responsible for producing, you know, the misery and suffering and pain, the death and destruction in Afghanistan, and, you know, determined to perpetuate it and continue it. Zahir Wahab, what, what is the story with this money, these billions of dollars? Uh, whose money is it, and what is the U.S. government trying to do with it, and what should it be doing with it when people have nothing to eat? Yes, uh, the United States knows full well, because directly or through Doha, you know, the U.S. Embassy is in Doha uh, right now. Uh, This is when uh, the United States uh, in August 2021 either was defeated, kicked out, or just lost interest, or whatever the reasons when they left by the end of August, it immediately froze the 
uh, $7 billion, which was uh, Afghanistan's money. It was not a government's money or Taliban money or the previous government. This is money that belongs to the Afghan nation in Afghanistan, and it was deposited for safekeeping in the Federal Reserves in New York. Seven billion in New York and three billion in a couple of European nations just to safe keep so that, uh, you know, this was important uh, so that the Afghan currency can be stabilized. So, you know, that um, there is liquidity, there is cash, uh, they trade in commerce, imports and exports. And all other macro and microeconomic activities can continue. But the United States immediately froze this money. And not only that, but also declared complete economic sanctions um, uh, on Afghanistan. You know, earlier this, uh, this year, last year, I could not send small amounts of money through Western Union to some starving family because we were you could not send money to Afghanistan. In other words, the United States forced all other governments, NGOs, multilateral agencies not to, uh, you know, help Afghanistan economically, to starve essentially economically and starve it not just financially, but also physically and in terms of food and so forth. Uh, and so the whole world is against this, you know, other governments, the UN, the OIC, the Afghan people, even people who don't like the Taliban have been demonstrating saying, Give us our stolen money and end these economic sanctions because we're dying. You know, millions of people are actually on the verge of starvation. And that's why today, as you know, there's a, for months now, there's an unfreeze Afghanistan uh, movement in this country and globally underway. And also some of the government, Biden said, some of the money will be given to the families of the 9-11 atrocity. And, but 70 plus families of the 9-11 families for peaceful tomorrows, as you know, have written to Biden that they do not want this money. They want the money to be returned to the Afghan people. And 70 plus academicians, professors, and even people like Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winner, you know, have written to Biden to return this stolen money. This is illegal. And yet, you know, the United States government refuses, although I'm reading that uh, talks are underway to see if this money can be deposited in a trust fund so that it can be slowly given to, uh, deposited for Afghanistan or given to the Afghan nation, but not the Taliban. In other words, this economic warfare, which is more vicious, deadlier than the physical and military warfare, as you know, needs to end. And people are saying, end this, and the United States refuses to do so. So this is where we are, and there's no cash. No one has any money in Afghanistan. Universities, schools, uh, agencies, uh, businesses, individuals, uh, you know, because salaries have been half, half of the labor force have been laid off. Uh, you know, economic activity has almost been crippled. So it is a very bad situation. It, it, obviously, it's illegal to steal someone else's money, uh, it also is supposedly illegal under the Geneva Conventions to engage in collective punishment. Uh, uh, perhaps that's legal since it's not a war anymore. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it seems like regardless of how anyone got here, the very worst thing you could do would be to steal resources from the worst place on Earth uh, that's suffering the most, that has the most people facing starvation uh exactly how does exactly i mean you would think that you know this is wrong no matter how you look at it and yet washington is you know uh, refuses uh you know it's it's as i said uh, i i'm in touch with people professors teachers uh, associates friends and relatives uh, you know and i watch the afghan press because i speak both uh, Farsi and Pashto, in addition to what's available in English, it really is the. It's worse than this. Uh, I think uh, David Miliband, uh, the head of the IRC, who was the foreign minister of Britain, said this is much worse than you can imagine, which is true. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's I call it uh, sort of a slow motion genocide brought on television. It is collective punishment at worst than collective punishment. 
how the United States, Washington, I should say, does this is beyond me. Uh, and look at the situation, how it deals with the crises in Ukraine, which, of course, as you know, the United States and, and the West provoked. Now, you know, it's a proxy, another proxy war. But you know why we need this system needs wars. If there were no wars, the military industrial complex will invent wars. And that's why, uh, you know, um, the uh, uh, different organization uh, have said cigar is very, a very good source for this saying, this is unnecessary, it's illegal, it's immoral, this needs to stop. There's something right. ironic about a nation that's being invaded and occupied by the United States and European militaries putting all its wealth in the United States and Europe for safekeeping. Uh, it, it seems like <laughs> the last place you would want to put your money. Is there a lesson that's going to be learned here uh, along the lines of don't put your money in New York City? Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, but as you know, a lot of countries from China to Russia, uh, you know, to other countries, they think this is perhaps the safest, most stable, secure place. And uh, this money was not recent, the Afghan money. This has been there for um, years and years. You know, this is money that belongs to the Afghanistan Bank, the uh, Central Bank or what would be their Federal Reserve. So uh, they were doing this. But now we know and also those Panama Papers, uh, as you know, uh, the United States, while lecturing other people on money laundering and dirty money, as you know, this is the best place to launder your money. I think it's one of the Dakotas, if I'm not mistaken, where anyone can launder any amount of money. Now we know that. So, uh, in other words, uh, the emperor has been shown to have no clothes. And this is one of the most criminal regimes on earth. Uh, and yet, it's propaganda, you know, it's uh, pressures, it's the ways it sort of manipulate and maintain its hegemony, uh, you know, has convinced or forced people to sort of accept the, the mythology, uh, you know, and the broad uh, false picture painted often by the United States. I think maybe we can focus on what needs to be done. David, I don't know how much time we have and if you have other Sure, questions. we have about six minutes. That would be great. Okay, so I think what needs to be done immediately without delay, I would say a couple of things. Return Afghanistan's stolen money in the form of a trust fund to be managed by a credible, clean, competent organization of international uh, personnel. Lift all economic sanctions so that all governments, all people, all agencies, NGOs, etc., can assist Afghanistan, whether it's cash, material, medicines, textbooks, food, whatever. Um, apologize. The United States and its allies must apologize uh, globally to Afghanistan and other countries that it has savaged, uh, especially to Afghanistan that has savaged it for, you know, at least two decades. Uh, close the Guantanamo, you know, prison. There are people, as you know, still a few Afghans who are not even being charged, but have been kept there for more than 20 years. This needs to be closed. And I would say the United States and its allies must pay reparations to Afghanistan, to individuals, you know, like when my brother disappeared, but also to families, individuals, the country, schools, organizations, and government. It must pay proper reparation. And uh, it must, the world community must activate the macro economy of Afghanistan and its micro economy. It must restore banking, banking, you know, uh, uh, credits, uh, liquidity, uh, and loans, uh, and economic activity so that the country's economy, unless we activate the Afghan economy, these humanitarian assistance are just stopgap measures, as you know. This is just the band-aid put on this. Imagine a country, you know, it's dis destruction, it's um, drought and fl flash floods now, the diseases and all that. Uh, what are we going to do a year from now, two years from now, five years? So we must do economic development. Uh, an international trust fund must be founded so that Afghanistan 
uh, cash can be uh, reserved and spent properly, pressure, cajole, and monitor the Taliban to do the right thing. The Taliban must change. This is not a madrasa. This is a country. They need to learn how to run a country, you know, in the 22nd year, 2021, whether it's economics, society, education, human rights, women's conditions, schools, universities, streets, press, you name it. Uh, the world community must fully respect Afghanistan's independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and its overall self-sufficiency. Um, the international organization must guarantee that no one directly or indirectly intervenes in Afghan affairs. And the world must be aware of the fact that unless Afghanistan is restored to like a normal country, uh, the drugs, uh, extremism, uh, religionism, you know, and immigration will come and haunt us even in Portland, Oregon. And as I said, we need to stop the slow motion genocide and, you know, um, end the af suffering of the Afghan people. But also we need to, the United States and the world needs to work on a new architecture of peace, development, cooperation, and security for all people everywhere. Uh, we have about two minutes left, a minute and a half left. Uh, a lot of aid, actual humanitarian aid, is going to Ukraine and the people of Ukraine, uh, which is a wonderful thing, although vastly more is going into weapons to make matters worse for them. Uh, is it possible for people to send aid to Afghanistan, to places like Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, that have seen vastly more death and suffering thus far than in Ukraine? aren't getting the sort of attention. How do you, how do you send help? Yes, uh, I mean, David, double standards in terms of, say, compare Ukraine to Afghanistan or any other places, uh, it's so obvious. Uh, it doesn't even need any discussion, I think. You know, the racism, the double standards, the north-south thing, the white, non-white, the Eurocentrism, American exceptionalism, American interests, proxy war, American, you know, competition with Russia and China, these are all very obvious and it's sickening. So uh, I think uh, uh, what we need to do is to do the same thing in Afghanistan. Although in fact, over the last year, about $800 million have gone into Afghanistan. Even now, every month, the United Nations brings in about $30 million in cash, you know, that gives it to private banks and some of it to the central bank. So it's not the United States is relenting. And what we need to do is uh, stop, you know, just cash and re reserve the money, but also develop the country. As I keep saying, what the world needs to do is instead of giving cash and Band-Aid and, you know, bread and tents and some aspirin, they need to work on serious macro development in Afghanistan so that, uh, this country's misery and this country is the sort of nest of uh, future trouble can end once and for all. Uh, yeah. It's not difficult. The UN is very happy to be an intermediary to channel and funnel all kinds of aid from the rest of the world to Afghanistan. And this is uh, being negotiated right now. Happy. Very well said. We've been speaking with Zahir Wahab, Professor Emeritus, Lewis and Clark College and American University of Afghanistan. Zahir, thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you very much, David Swanson. Thank you, no, and good luck. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.